and gentlemen, we can have your attention. Welcome to the 2022 Patriots Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I'm John Rook, very proud to be the voice of Gillette Stadium here for your six-time world champion New England Patriots. Fifteen days ago marked the 20th anniversary of the first game played here at Gillette Stadium. Defending Super Bowl champion Patriots hosted the Pittsburgh Steelers back on September the 9th of 2002 and claimed a 30-14 to 14 victory that day. And as you can see to my left, well, a little bit has changed since that point in time. But Gillette Stadium is getting a makeover. It's getting a new lighthouse, getting a new atrium, and the biggest outdoor LED video board in America. We'll welcome fans in 2023 as part of the always ongoing efforts to enhance the in-stadium experience for you, all of our fans. Now, before we kick off the program today, I want to begin with just a, a slight remembrance, if we can, pay our respects to a legend that we've lost. Last May, the Patriots Hall of Fame, the entire Patriots organization, and so many of our fans mourned the passing of Patriots Hall of Famer Gino Capaletti. You know, Gino was an original Boston Patriot. He won the league MVP in 1964. His career spanned six decades as a Patriot player, coach, and broadcaster. So before we proceed with today's ceremonies, if we could please pause for a moment of silence to fondly remember our friend, the Duke, Gino Capaletti. Thank you. 18 years ago, yeah. 18 years ago, the Patriots used the 21st pick in the 2004 NFL Draft to select Vince Wilford, a defensive tackle from the University of Miami. Today, we're all here, we're gathered here to honor Vince for a dominant career over 11 seasons with the Patriots, which included a Super Bowl championship in his rookie season and in his final season. Those titles serve as incredible bookends to his Hall of Fame Patriots career. Vince created very many memorable moments for all of us during his playing career, and today it's our turn to make this moment memorable for him and his family. So let's hear it. You ready to get started? No, 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 that ain't going to do it. I said, are you ready to get started? That's a little more like it. All right, before introducing our alumni in attendance today, we'd like to invite six very special guests to the stage because they represent the six most memorable seasons in franchise history. Yeah, that's uh, six of my best friends right there, huh? 
All right, today we are honored to welcome back all of our Patriots alumni in attendance. Collectively, they represent 90 years of Patriot service, covering five different decades from the 1970s through the 2010s. So please provide a warm welcome as I introduce the Patriots alumni in attendance with us today. Let's start it off. Coach Rick Buffington. Center Pete Brock. Tackle Rick Cash. Linebacker Matt Chatham. Running back Thomas Clayton. Cornerback Marquise Cole. Linebacker Vernon Crawford. Defensive lineman Marcus Forston. Tight end Paul Francisco. Defensive end Jarvis Green. Linebacker Ilya Yaroschuk. Linebacker Steve King. Center Dan Copen. Defensive back Ronnie Lippet. Linebacker Gerard Mayo. Defensive back Scooter Magruder. Running back, Patrick Pass. Nose tackle, Tom Perel. Nose tackle, Mike Ruth. Defensive tackle, Ed Toner. Wide receiver, Randy Vataha. Tackle, David Pien. Quarterback, Scott Zolak. We also have some Patriots Hall of Famers here today that we would like to also introduce and welcome today's honoree. Before we introduce them, I'd like to recognize for a moment Mr. Mark Santos, who's here representing his father, Patriots Hall of Fame broadcaster Gil Santos. I'd also like to recognize Rachel Nance. Here's representing her father, Hall of Fame running back Jim Nance. I think we'd also be remiss if we didn't recognize one of our current Patriot players who was a teammate of Vince Wilforks here in front, Mr. Devin McCourty. And also, Mr. Matthew Slater. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this player defined the team concept that has been the trademark of this recent championship era. He played offense, defense, and special teams during his 15-year career with the Patriots from 1993 to 2007. He's the team's all-time leading punt returner, he ranks third in receptions and fifth in receiving yards. He also happened to intercept three passes while playing defensive back in 2004 when he helped the Patriots to their third Super Bowl title in four years. He now coaches receivers and kick returners for the Patriots. Please welcome 2012 Patriots Hall of Fame inductee, Troy Brown! <laughs>
was feared by opponents as one of the greatest linebackers to ever play the game and as the franchise record holder with 100 career sacks. He holds the team record for most sacks in a season with 18 and a half in 1984. His 35 sacks by a linebacker over a two-year span remain a National Football League record. He was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2008 after spending his entire career with the Patriots. Please welcome Patriot and Pro Football Hall of Famer, Andre Tippett. <laughs> Now it is my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's honoree. If you would please turn your attention to the video boards for some highlights from his Hall of Fame career. Blessed with two first round picks in the 2004 NFL Draft, the defending Super Bowl champion Patriots were pleasantly surprised that with the first of their two selections at number 21, a player they had significant interest in was still there for the taking. With the uh, 21st pick in the 2004 NFL Draft, the New England Patriots select Vince Wilfork, defensive lineman, University of Miami. Will Fork was a defensive anchor for the Patriots for 11 seasons. I always want, waiting for this day to come and, and it's finally here. Serving as a defensive captain for seven consecutive years. One, two, three, three, three. The team played in 21 playoff games, six AFC championship games, and four Super Bowls with Will Fork. Vince bookended his Patriots career with Super Bowl championships 2004 and 2014. He could run, he could move, and um, you know, honestly, Vince would say it all the time, he's one of the best athletes out there, and he was probably right. His quickness was unbelievable for a guy his size. He could just cover a lot of space and, and obviously play with great strength, uh, but his, his nimbleness to get through the line was amazing uh, to be able to get to the ball. One of the best examples of you know Vince being a Hall of Fame player for the Patriots, 2011 AFC Championship game, we're playing Baltimore, and I remember Vince coming to us in the secondary, and he said, don't worry about the run game, Don't, we got it up front. When we came in that next day and Bill pulled up the film, he said, this is a dominating performance. Knowing that he's gonna be leading the charge, he's gonna go out there and make sure that everyone's held accountable. Um, man, you walk into the game knowing you're gonna win. One, two, three, win! May not show up in the stats, but uh, the reason that anybody had any stats on the field was because he was out there. What an amazing player. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our 2022 Patriots Hall of Fame inductee, Vince Wilford! Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest works tirelessly to make sure that the Patriot fan experience is second to none and to ensure that those fans know how much the organization really appreciates your loyalty. Please welcome Patriots Chief Marketing Officer Jen Farron. Thank you, John. 
Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here today. It is an honor to welcome you to Gillette Stadium for our 14th Hall of Fame induction ceremony. This event has become an annual tradition that brings together players and coaches, past and present, and equally important, our incredible fan base from throughout New England. We are the only NFL team that allows its fans to be part of the Hall of Fame induction process. And each year, you prove that your knowledge and support in selecting our inductee makes you the greatest fans in the NFL. We last gathered here in the NL Plaza only one year ago to honor Richard Seymour and Tracy Cermonti. And as you can see by looking around, much has changed. Construction is now well underway on the latest renovations to Gillette Stadium. And these renovations, along with the many others that have taken place over the past 20 years, continue our long-standing commitment to improving the experience both on game day and non-game day. We're excited about the work that is being done and we look forward to its completion prior to the start of the 2023 NFL regular season. When Gillette Stadium was being built, the Kraft family also had a vision of creating a space that would memorialize and celebrate the incredible history of the New England Patriots. Along with that, they also had a vision of creating a space that held a purpose beyond just football. With the support of our long-standing partner, Raytheon Technologies, the Patriots Hall of Fame is designed to teach fans and school groups about the impact of math and science on the game of football. Our exhibits and our educational modules incorporate science, technology, engineering, and math into our programming and allow us to offer year-round learning in a fun and interactive setting. The Patriots and Raytheon Technologies strive to inspire young students to pursue careers in STEM-related fields that will help develop future chemists, engineers, analysts, computer scientists, and we hope huge Patriots fans. Since opening our hall doors, we have welcomed more than 1.3 million visitors, and we average more than 20,000 students a year. Thank you to Raytheon Technologies for being such an incredible partner on this journey. We are proud of the legacy that we have built at the Patriots Hall of Fame, and we are thrilled to induct our newest member today. Thank you. You know, I remember when this next gentleman brought the New England Patriots back in 1994, and he vowed to help bring a championship here to New England. Well, not only did he deliver, he delivered an NFL record six times. But in the 28 years since making that pledge, the Patriots possessed the highest winning percentage among all men's professional sports teams in this country. It's my pleasure to introduce the chairman and CEO of the New England Patriots, Mr. Robert Kraft. Thank you for that kind introduction. And this is great looking out here today, seeing all of you coming here to honor our guy there. But uh, as I thank everyone here coming today, the real special thanks goes to the Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> Why? Well, a trade with the Ravens in 03 gave us the first pick in the 04 draft overall. And of course, with that draft pick, we picked our guy Vince. And actually, I think there's a little karma there that we're playing Baltimore tomorrow, too. <laughs> so, in the next 11 years after he got drafted, Vince anchored a defensive unit that helped propel the Patriots to 10 division titles, six AFC championships, four trips to the Super Bowl, and two great parades in downtown Boston. You know, there are a lot of really big players who battled in the trenches in the NFL, but few have ever had the combined size, strength, quickness 
in overall athletic ability as Vince. As a nose tackle in a two-gap scheme, Vince's role was to draw double teams in order to free up the linebackers behind him. It was a thankless job, but one in which the likes of Teddy Bruschi and our friend Gerard Mayo, who's here today, were forever grateful. You know, as you saw in the highlights film, Vince just didn't tackle enemy ball carriers. He steamrolled them. <laughs> and as much as we enjoyed watching him punish an opposing quarterback, there was nothing for me that was more entertaining than watching uh, opponents trying to tackle Vince when he returned an interception <laughs> or a fumble. And he might have been a little bigger in those days when he was doing it. So clearly Vince made an immediate impact on the field and left a lasting impression, typically in the chest of his opponents. <laughs> and that, of course, is the reason we're all here today. But I want to share a more personal anecdote about Vince and the first impression he made upon me. I met Vince right after he was drafted in 04, a big-bodied, fresh-faced, first-round choice, draft choice out of the U. He was only 23, but had an old soul. He was already married and grounded by the experience, the unfortunate experience of losing both of his parents two years before David and Barbara. He arrived in my office wearing a black dress shirt with a large gold dress medallion draped around his neck. David and Barbara's wedding photo was on the medallion. Vince said it kept his loved ones close to his heart and gave him strength by wearing it, and he wore it every day. That gesture alone earned Vince a place in the Kraft Family Hall of Fame, and he became one of our all-time favorites. <laughs> On a game day, when Vince was leaving the field after warm-ups, he saw my beloved Mara and leaned in to give her a kiss on her, on her cheek. In an endearing and yet slightly awkward moment, he gave me one as well. <laughs> so we won the game that day. And not that I'm superstitious, but that started a new tradition. And when he gave those kisses, he might have been perspiring a little. <laughs> but years later, when Myra's health was declining in 2011, Vince gave me a special gift, a gold medallion with Myra and my wedding picture on it. And you have to understand, I don't wear rings or jewelry of any kind, but I love the sentiment. No player had ever done anything like that for me before. So I put it on and showed Myra at her bedside. She happened to be in intensive care in the hospital in Boston. And she said to me, you look ridiculous. <laughs> As usual, she was right, of course. <laughs> but it kept her close to my heart and gave me strength. And after she passed, I wore it every day for nearly a year. So the first game after Myra's passing, I was an emotional wreck. But 
Vin sought me out as he left the field after warm-ups. This time he gave me a kiss on each cheek, and he said one was for you and the other was for Mama. And it was the start of a tradition that continued prior to every game for the next four seasons. I will always be grateful for, to Vince for doing that. Now, Patriot fans will remember Vince for his big body, even bigger smile, and always making the biggest plays. For a decade of Patriots Donovan's, no defender played a bigger role, both literally and figuratively, than Vince Wilfork. Vince gave us all many memorable moments in which we could all be thankful. But the greatest came on Thanksgiving against our friends, the Jets. <laughs> no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Years ago, we talked to Tom Moore then in Indianapolis, the offensive coordinator. You're going to bust the play here. And then oh, no. and Sanchez gets hit. The ball is loose, and it's alive. I have never seen this before in my life. Watch this. Vince Wilfork is going to throw Brandon Moore back into his quarterback. He's going to fumble the football. This is what Reggie White used to do to people. Well. In a word, Wilfork was simply invincible. I'm honored to present Vince with his red jacket, and it's only a matter of time, hopefully, before he gets a gold one, which he truly deserves. It's my pleasure to introduce the 32nd member of the Patriots Hall of Fame, Vince Wilfork. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I am very, um, very honored to be standing here before of all of you guys today at um, being able to be a Patriot Hall of Fame. Um, as a player, I never really thought about being a Hall of Famer. You know, my, my goal was always playing football on a game I love. But to understand who I am, you have to understand my journey. Um, when I first got drafted, right, something funny, here we go. <laughs> so I'm at the draft and back home and, you know, they was like, okay, the New England Patriots select Vince Wilford, University of Miami. So I'm sitting here saying, New England, is that like the new part of England? Like, I have to travel out of the country to go play? Like, where is New England? And they were like, no, it's Boston Celtics, Boston. I said, oh yeah, all you have to do is just say Boston. I'm, I'm okay, I know that. So, but here I am, a Southern boy, this never really traveled much. You know, the only traveling I did was playing football in college and we in and out. So I, I had no clue where New England was. I know Boston, Massachusetts, but New England, I'm like, okay, whatever. So, I got acquainted real quick there. But, you know, since I was four or five years old, I told my father what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a professional football player. That was my goal. That's just what it was. There was nothing else. That's what I wanted to do. So, I only played one, one year of football because after that, I was either too small, I mean, too big or too young. So, it's like, what was the next best thing for me to do was 
it was to play basketball. And that's what I did. I played basketball. Became a really pretty good basketball player. But even as I did that, you know, I had issues at home where my father's sick. You know, just imagine being eight, nine, ten years old where you have to carry your father to the restroom because he's too weak to walk himself. And I'm a kid. But it didn't matter to me. You know, my father needed help. My mom needed help. This is what we do. Or imagine being 11, 12 years old and your grandmother is dead in your arms and you have to take her in the car and get her home because we can't call the ambulance. Or imagine being 13 years old, coaching 10-year-old basketball, a head coach at 13. <laughs> yeah, me, a head coach, 13 years old, coaching basketball. And here I go, still, family struggling. Um, I had a lot of family members turn their backs on us. It was holidays I didn't have, my family we didn't have. We had to figure out how we was going to eat and survive as a kid. But through all of that, I stayed true to who I was. I played sports, it was basketball, and when I got to high school, that was my first time playing football since I was four or five years old. That was my first time going back playing. I started as a freshman on a varsity. I was a defensive end. I was 275 pounds <laughs> in high school. <laughs> that was my freshman year. Sophomore year, I'm 308 pounds. Yeah, so grown man. But with all of that, still, my father was still suffering. Mother, out of work. My family, we had to figure it out. So I went through high school, and my father, probably the toughest man I ever known. Because back then, I didn't understand what he was going through. I just saw, and I'm, I got to do what I had to do. Help my, but I never understood how bad diabetes was back then. And, you know, my father always like, listen, we don't want you do it. You be a kid. He always wanted me to be a kid. You, you live your life. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. But guess what? Every practice, and have my, I have my brother up here. He'll tell you every practice. My father was there. I would leave the locker room, go get him out the car, roll him in a wheelchair to the practice field, go back in with my team, and then I come back out to practice. When practice was up, I would roll him back to the car, get him in the car, he wait for me to figure out, finish doing what I had to do, and we go home. That's what I did daily. Because my father never wanted to miss an opportunity to see his son play football. But I did that freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year. Rolled my father to practice, got him out of the car, took him to the practice field, brung him back when practice, brung him back to it, went back in, take my stuff off, and we go home. But I know how much it meant to my father to be there. I knew that. I knew how much love he had for football. My mom loved it too, but my mom was the one. She was like, oh, whatever, huh? I'll see you at the game. <laughs> yeah. So she supported me. I'm not saying that, but my father. Why I'm built the way that I'm built. I had to survive. I had to learn how to survive at a very young age. No one never gave me anything, nothing. Everything I got, I worked for. I worked for, I worked for. I grind, I put the time in. I never got any handouts, ever. And here it is, I lose my parents. <laughs> I lose my parents. 
20 years old, my, my father, day before my mother's birthday, June 5th, 02. My mother's birthday, June 6th. My mama have a birthday. My first game I ever missed in college. Around my birthday time, I got a call. They had to rush my mother to the hospital. We was getting ready to go play the Tennessee Vols. They rushed my mother to the hospital. My mother passed December 16th, six months later. I, was turn I turned 21, then I lose my mother before Christmas, December 16th. So here you go, a kid that really never much had a family. The only family I had was what I had in my house. Now they gone. And at that time, my daughter was about to be born, my first child, no parents. And in that moment, I quit football. I quit. I gave it up because the only reason I wanted to play was to make it have a better living for my parents, get them out. Let them enjoy life with all the struggles, with all the surviving. Like, that's the only reason I wanted them to play football. It wasn't for me. It was for my mom and my dad. So it was easy for me to walk away from it and say, screw it. It didn't matter. But I thank God for my defensive line coach at the University of Miami. He set me down, and he basically said, you do what your parents wanted you to do. And I said, ah, I'll think about it. He really didn't care. But the more I thought about it, the more I came to my senses, and I picked back up my career. Fast forward, I get drafted, 21st pick, I come to New England. One of the best decisions that RKK <laughs> made, and Bill Belichick <laughs> made. But at the same time, I was still missing my mother and my father. I can't tell you how many times I left the practice field or left a game, um, tore up inside. I get a chance to walk back, walk past my teammates and have their families, you know, their mom, their dad, their brothers, their sisters. They wise, they have a good time, you know? And I'm hurt inside because I don't have my mother and father here to enjoy this life with me. And I felt that way for 13 years. I played 13 years in the league. So thir for 13 years, I had to battle that. For 13 years, I put a smile on when I was really hurting. But nobody would ever knew. They would never know. But I can sit here today and tell you, for 13 years, I played hurt with a heavy heart. I played, I, played, I played with a broken heart. I played with a heart in my hole for 13 years. And that's just in the NFL. So when you look at who the person I am, what I've accomplished, you guys are not fans to me. You are my family. <laughs> I'm a survivor. Man, I try to get through it without crying. <laughs> but I'm a survivor. I worked hard my whole life. Man. 
I had the greatest teammates ever. <laughs> greatest fans ever. <laughs> greatest owner ever. <laughs> greatest coach ever. Everybody that I worked with and counted over my whole career, trainers, staff, business, equipment manager, Stacy, the media, even though I got on your nerves, <laughs> but especially my teammates. You made my life a lot easier. And I'll forever be grateful for that. So I want to say thank you to everyone. Everyone is my family. And I love all of you. Because without you, it wasn't me, no me. So I want to say I really, really appreciate the love that you always shown me and the memories you gave me, and the memories I gave you guys. We all did this together. So I'm wearing this jacket, but this jacket is for all of us because you made me who I was at this level. So I would say thank you. Vince, we love you too. We love you too. At this time, I'd like to invite Scott Zolak to the stage, along with three of Vince's former teammates. So let's give a warm welcome to Gerard Mayo, Marquise Cole, and current Patriot safety Devin McCourty, who becomes the first active player in our 14-year history to participate in these induction ceremonies. Guys, come on up. All right, how's everybody doing? Ready for that Ravens game? That's right. Real quick, uh, before you get here tomorrow, I'm, I'm sure you lot have tickets. Uh, Jen did a great job talking. There will be regular entry down here in the plaza as long as everything still looks different, but we'll get you in the stadium tomorrow. Just get here, get, get lubed up, and get ready. All right. So no, the other guy that's not up here, I want to recognize him real quick, Matthew Slater, team captain. He'll be up here one day. He'll be up here one day. Tip, Troy, thank you for recognizing uh, the red jacket. Mr. Kraft, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, so we're going to get this started. So what we got here is Vince. And uh, could you have done that speech in 2004 again? That same speech you just gave, could no, you have done it? None of my speeches are the same. Life experience, right? Life experiences. I just, you know, you have to understand a journey to understand someone. You know, and that was my whole deal is my journey in life made me become who I became. I had to be a leader at a very young age. I had to do important, make important decisions at a very young age. So I think that's translated over to my career and being able to have teammates and be able to lead the way I led. I think my life experiences had helped me with it. So. Um, it was a growing process, you know, and I never understood when I was younger what it was all about, but when I became a teammate up at this level in the leadership and understanding how people look at me and they value my opinion and they, everything that come out of my mouth, it's like they glued to me. I had to be on point, so 
I pass the torch to these guys, and hopefully I've done a great job of leading them. All right, we'll get to those guys and some of the stories that they have. So your positional coach, when you came out in 04, said, boy, this guy's really good. Even at 295 pounds when he was in sixth grade, that's weight, weight difference. He said, this guy can really diagnose the screen pass. You picked off three of those in your career. What made you so good at that? Just being, rec you know, recognition. Um, I've always was a player that wanted to make plays inside of my, my bubble. And just, a, I think it's a player's IQ. Um, I, was, I was never a defensive tackle that just only thought about, they, have been, they would tell you, I would talk about coverages with them in routes because I wanted to know because I never know if I might get in a situation where I might have to cover. <laughs> I need to know what I was doing. But, you know, screens was one of those things where um, it was just football IQ and just understanding the game. And I think understanding the game allowed me to dissect a lot of plays that normally a nose tackle wouldn't diagnose. Okay. So when Vince first got here, team won its third Super Bowl in four years. It took another 10 years until you won another one. Talk about that span and what it meant bookending your career here with two rings. Well, when I won it the first time, the first time we won, I said it's going to be easy because in college, I go to college, my first year we win one, so a national championship. The next year we come back, they rob us, Ohio State. So I was back to back. So here I am, a freshman, you know, a rookie in NFL, and I win one. So I'm sitting back saying, man, it's going to be easy. I'm going to have 20 rings, <laughs> you know? And the more you play, the more you realize, like, it ain't that easy, you know? And it just got you to understand how hard it is to win at this level, day in and day out. It's very, very difficult, but we made it look so easy. And I think sometimes forget, people forget Winning is hard, especially when you have a bullseye on your back every single year, every single week. When you run the NFL like we've done for the past two decades, we are bullseye. So everybody have us in their scope. That makes it even harder for us to game plan. Um, it makes us harder for so many other things because we basically have to be perfect. So, but after a while, I realized, I said, yeah, you know, it's an honor to be in a Super Bowl. So the next time we get here, I want to win. So I learned a lesson probably year four or five that this don't come around often. All right. Last question here for Vince before we get to the rest of the panel. Can't ask Devin or Gerard because the guy's standing over there. Pros and cons of playing a two-gap system under Coach Belichick. Well, as a defense attack of stats. You're not going to get this. You know, you're not going to get those stats, and it's boring. Being a two gapper is boring, honestly. Like we sit here, we take on blockers, and we get get up. Yeah, yeah. And like for me, he get all the tackles. Thank you. You know, he get all the tackles. So it's like for me, you you at the you at the bottom of the pile all the time. They already in the huddle, you still getting up. By the time you get up, they at the ball, and I'm looking around like, what's the call? <laughs> so it's a dirty man's job <laughs> being a two-gapper, but I respect two-gappers to the fullest because it takes a real man to two-gap, a real one. And I think I qualify for one of those. So he does. He qualifies. <laughs> Let's give him a hand on that one. All right. First question from Mark, Marquise here. So you weren't here for Vince's whole tenure, but when did the relationship start? What do you think about this guy as a player? And more importantly, your relationship with him and how it's developed, how you stayed close over the years? Uh, I'm a big trash talker. So as soon as I got here, me and Dev linked instantly. So then me and V started talking because he also is a big trash talker. So we started talking about basketball. I don't know if you remember. Forston was on the team. It was V. Forced, uh, I think Chan, Chandler, and for like a week or so, we had talked it all up. Vince cooked a big spread for everybody. We came out, but then we, we put it on him. But he did not stop talking. But then after that, our relationship just grew more and more, and uh, it expanded way past football. And the biggest things that, about Vince that people don't understand, like as he is as a person, whatever you think Hall of Fame person, I mean, player, as a person, as a father, as a friend, he's astronomically even further than that. So a lot of our memories are way away from the field. 
Great answer. All right. Gerard Mayo, great player out of Tennessee. You come here, it's tough playing at the next level. This guy was in front of you. What made you be a great player because of this guy? Man, his job was easy. It was easy. <laughs> That's what Zach Thomas said. He had all those big bodies down in Miami in front of him. No, but honestly, um, I was rookie of the year, and I heard all these horror stories coming into a... Slid that in there, see that? Horror stories, right? <laughs> no, shameless plug, I was rookie of the year. But really, I owe, it, I owe it to this guy right here. Seriously, a guy... Like, everything that Vince did, it, it, I mean, it's been said multiple times. It didn't show up on the stat sheet. Um, you're my bodyguard. I probably should get you something here soon. <laughs> maybe, I'll take another maybe, Rolex. <laughs> get, get, get you a watch or something. Or a but Range Rover. Everything you did, though, it was for the team. And I think kind of, you know, piggybacking on what Quise was talking about, it didn't matter what position you played. It didn't matter if you were on offense, defense, special teams. Vince was all about community. And just hearing your story today, it kind of brought it full circle. You had offensive linemen at the house. You had quarterbacks at the house. You had linebackers. And it was all about food, obviously. But then it was also about, it was also about just building the camaraderie amongst the guys. And there was nothing I wouldn't do for this man, and I feel the same way. I, I hope he feels the same way about me. Absolutely. Great stuff. All right, last question here, Devin McCourty. You came in as a young player. Vince was already here. What kind of impact did he have on your career and get you going as a Patriot? Oh, man, he had a huge impact. I mean, first of all, when he talked about talking coverage, the only thing he said coverage-wise, he was like, I'm about to tell Bill, all we need to do is play cover two, and you just keep him at the line of scrimmage. He can't run around if you jam him. Did he know what cover six was? No, he, he know cover, cover two. <laughs> That's all he know, play cover two. Um, but, you know, like both these guys said, I think for me, um, you know, obviously he played defensive line. I played in the secondary, different jobs, but his leadership um, and I think just being able to go talk to him. You know, I still remember the ugly side, the business side of football. I talked to this guy like every day when I was a free agent. He prepared me, told me how things went. Um, and then I think most importantly for the rest of my career, I knew the type of leader I needed to be was always what the team needed. And I thought that's what he showed me. He showed me whether it was to talk to the team, whether it was to come out and dominate uh, a game plan. And uh, I think one of the, the coolest things that you would see from him is he would want to go against the best offensive lineman. He would want that matchup. He would want the team to know, I don't care about stats. I don't care. If this guy's supposed to be good, I'm going to punch him in the mouth every single play, and everybody else is going to eat. And that's the example he set for myself, guys like Slate that are still playing, that both of us try to emulate and show the guys now, starting with guys like him. All right, awesome. So here's what we're gonna do, rapid fire. You guys get to pick one word to, to describe this guy. Start with Marquise. One word to describe Vince. Funny. Funny. Yeah. Male. Beast. Beast. Teddy bear. <laughs> Teddy bear, that's the one. Gentlemen, back to your seats. I'll turn it over to John Brook. We have one more special guest. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome the greatest coach in NFL history. Since taking over the Patriots in 2000, he's guided the team to an incredible 17 division titles, nine AFC championships, the only head coach in history to win six Super Bowls. Please welcome Patriot head coach Bill Belichick. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Great to see so many fans and, and Patriots, expatriates, and uh, it's uh, an awesome turnout. So, you know, this is such a special day. Um, I'm so honored to to be here to to be part of Vince's induction. And uh, you know, everybody up here is kind of like stolen my thunder. I mean. All the, all the comments that have been made, um, all were, I was gonna say that. Uh, you know, I was gonna say that. And that was the story I was gonna tell. And, uh, but I think you can, you can all see what type of person uh, Vince was. Not only was he a great player, like he said, as, as great of a player as he was, and he was great. 
Um, we'll get into the two gap in later. But um, <laughs> he was a greater person and, and a greater leader. And, and you know, he'll, he'll be up there. When they, do the, when they do the captains of the Patriots Hall of Fame, uh, Vince will be one of those, okay? Because that's, he's, he's that kind of a leader. I'm, I'm talking about a Hall of Fame leader as well as player, person, and everything else. And, you know, his, um, the, his devotion to the team is, is really legendary. You know, uh, and Vince talked about his, his background, but, you know, I'll just take it back to the first time I met him, which was in Indianapolis. I remember sitting in that hotel room. It was like a police lineup. We had about 18 people, and then there was Vince there in a chair with, I think we had two spotlights on him. So uh, it was pretty under the gun. But I think that from that moment, um, I, I was so impressed with the maturity, um, the intelligence, the self-awareness, the professionalism. Um, he, he was a man at whatever age that was, 22, 23, uh, well beyond his years, and was very... Under, articulate and understood what it took to be a pro athlete, what it took to be a champion, what it took to be, uh, again, a guy that's targeted and double teamed on every play because literally he was unblockable. The reason he got double teamed so much wasn't because he got double teamed so much. They had to double team him. They couldn't, but he was unblockable. They couldn't put one guy on him. So they had to put two, and then the problems just pushed somewhere else. So, uh, but when you're that kind of a player, that's, you get double covered, you get double plot, double teamed, you get, you know, you see all those things because you're, you're dominant at your position, and, and, uh, and Vince was. But, but the maturity and the, um, and the team, the, the, the team that just oozed from Vince in that, from that first meeting, and then until his rookie year when, of course, we drafted him as a nose tackle, here he is a Hall of Fame nose tackle, and naturally his rookie year he played where? Defensive end. Right, because we, we had a nose tackle, and so uh, you know Keith played t nose tackle, and we moved Vince to the defensive end. Never said a word, embraced it, uh, and played and played great. And we won a championship with him playing there. And they couldn't block him at end any better. They could block him at at, uh, at nose. And that's kind of the way he was too. Every every week, uh, and Devin mentioned it, and it's so true. Uh, put me up against the best guy. You know, we talk about who their best lineman is. They run behind this guy. This is their go-to blocker. This this guy's this. He's all this and all pro that and all something else. You know, Vince, put me on him. I'll take care of him. You know, let everybody else have a fair fight. But uh, give me that guy. And, and that takes a lot. It really it takes a lot for, for a player to come in and accept that challenge and meet that challenge, you know, every single week of, you know, um, let me go up against Mankin. So whoever the best guy is, like, put me up against him right here. And, I'll, you know, I want to continue to prove day after day after day after day after week after week, all right, that you can count on me to do my job and do it well. And... Um, and, and so that's what it was like coaching Vince. Uh, the captain's meetings, you know, there, there were a handful of guys. Uh, you know, Vince would be one of them, Brewski, you know, Mayo. Uh, you know, they would, they would tell me, Coach, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're messed up on this. Like, what are you thinking about? And, and you know what? You need that. You know, you need that. And, and Vince was one of those guys that wasn't afraid to speak up and say, hey, let's cut all this out. Here's what we need to do. All right. And... And, and I really appreciate that. I really appreciate your, your honesty and your uh, putting a team first. Yes, sir. And, and, that's, and again, it was always about the team. It was never about, oh, what's best for me and all that. Look, he had his chances. We ran some Diamond Fox. We, we gave you some shots there. We ran some tilt. Not on a lot of it, but we ran some. Uh, but, but, you know, Vince, we could always count on him. And, and he would, I think, you know, I think Devin said it too in, in the video about, hey, we'll handle the running game. You guys just get back there and cover the pass. We don't need you up here. Just stay back and handle the passing game. We got the run. And, you know, that kind of confidence, that kind of aura that he brought to the team uh, on a weekly basis, because the challenges are different every week. We saw a lot of great teams, obviously, you know, played the Colts twice a year, played Pittsburgh twice a year, played you know, all those teams. But he, he was always there for us. He was always there for us. And the, and the off the field leadership that he gave us, you know, from, you know, again, just community, just getting to know people, you know, it didn't matter who they were, staff members, players, players' wives, families, whoever they were. Uh, you know, he brought the team together. He was really a, a dynamic person that, that was the glue, you know, when the football team. And, and uh, it was, there aren't very many people like that, but I'll say this, and, and this is, you know, a little bit of the Willie, post-Willie McGinnis era, 
all right? But Vince was also that guy that when he said something, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody else was talking. Nobody else was giving any rebuttal. Nobody else was saying anything other than, yes, sir, Vince, we're behind you. Let's go. And he always led us down the right path. Always led us the right way. And so in closing, I would just like to V, personally thank you for what you have done for me, how much I have learned from you, your leadership, your competitiveness, your team attitude, your physical and mental toughness, all of which are on the superior 99 out of 100 scale, maybe higher. Um, thank you for all you've done for me, for my family, for this organization. Um, you are truly not only a Hall of Famer, but you're one of the captains on this Hall of Fame team. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for attending our 14th Induction ceremony for the Patriots Hall of Fame presented by Raytheon Technologies. And as we conclude today, I want to ask the Patriot Hall of Famers if they'll uh, remain on stage with Mr. Kraft for a few final group photos. And for everyone in attendance today, please note the Patriots Hall of Fame is open until 6 o'clock tonight. Additionally, we invite you to head up to the uh, Dean College stage at Patriot Place next to Bar Louie because the band South Street 6 is playing there as part of a fan rally. And we're going to be raffling off some tickets to tomorrow's season opener, providing a few giveaways and giving you a chance to meet some of our Patriot cheerleaders. So the fan rally is getting going now. You can head that way in an orderly fashion. And thank you. Most importantly, go Pat. See you tomorrow.